I was in social studies class and I sat next to a young boy um, who was very quiet. He was very different. He did dress very differently. He dressed in all black and he had occultic jewelry and he started to bring in books, spell books, books on third eye. I started to connect with these books. It's like the books wanted me to read it, but this weed felt very different. Everything started moving in slow motion. I started seeing my friends like in triples. My heart rate was really, really going fast, like boom, 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 and I can hear it. And then I could hear my heartbeat go boom, 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 and I collapsed. It's like God was extending his love, his mercy, his grace over me and said, daughter, I hear you. I've been trying to get your attention, but you haven't listened to me. Now, are you ready? I am real. And I said, God, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Help me. Growing up, um, I can remember from a very young age that we grew up in a Christian household. Um, both my parents are Christian. Um, they migrated from Bogota, Colombia here to Washington, D.C. Um, they had me and my sister. Um, so it's just my sister and I, and we grew up in the state of Maryland. And my whole life, I could just remember just Jesus. My whole ch childhood was just Jesus. Um, my parents would take us to church every Sunday. And I remember my mom would dress us in these beautiful church dresses, my sister and I in these matching church dresses with the hats and the cute little shoes. And I remember, uh, just loving to go to the children's ministry to learn about Jesus. And we had arts and crafts, and they would have reading time, and they would sing to us the Christian hymns then. And that was my favorite part. And I believe that that's where uh, music evolved in my life that way, as my father also was a musician and a singer at church. And um, music was very big in my household, and Jesus was everything in our household. That's all I can remember is just being around church family, uh, church friends, them coming over our house, we going over their house, going to retreats. Jesus was everything, our main focus in our household. As I grew older, I ended up going to middle school, and um, I believe that this is where the enemy had set up traps for me. Um, unknowingly, I was in social studies class, and I sat next to a young boy um, who was very quiet. He was very different. He did dress very differently. He dressed in all black, and he had occultic jewelry, you know, but again, I didn't know what that was. And at, at that moment, uh, I, I could tell that he was alone and to himself, and many people started bullying him in the classroom, and it was bothering me. I remember I would defend him. And I would say, leave him alone, you know, just leave him alone. And he, he looked at that and he drew close to me because of that, because, you know, he wasn't sticking up for himself. I had empathy for him and I was like, you know, I'm going to say something, leave him alone. And so I did. And then he drew closer to me and he started to open up. We became good friends. He started telling me about his family. He started telling me about his hobbies. And the more he felt comfortable with me, the darker the conversations became. Then suddenly he confessed to me that he was a, a practicing warlock. I didn't know what that was, you know. All I knew was Jesus. And so I asked him, what is that? And he said, well, I practice witchcraft. Now, I had heard of witchcraft, but then I, had, I became more interested. So what does that mean? So what do you do? And so he started answering my questions. And I noticed that I started to become curious and because of this, he knew I was becoming curious, and he started to bring in books, pretty dark books, um, spell books, books on third eye, books about necromancy, speaking to the dead, hmm. horoscopes. i never forget, he said, this is the Bible, and it was a satanic Bible he brought in from Anton LaVey, I'll never forget. And it looked pretty, it looked dark. I couldn't believe it, you know, this is all brand new to my ears. I had never seen this before. You know, this was a trap of the enemy, you know, to confuse me, to divert me from God because of the curiosity um, and the questions that I had. I, I was, to begin with, very curious. I wanted to know more. And so he said, here, keep the books. So I'll never forget, I put them in my backpack. I went home and I started reading them. 
Deep down inside, I knew it was bad because I was hiding them. I was hiding them from my parents. I started to get a little upset at my parents because I felt that my parents kept me in this bubble. They didn't want us to know about anything else but about Jesus. And so, you know, I, 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 was, I was angry. Like, why didn't they ever tell me about witchcraft? Why didn't they ever tell me about, you know, sorcery and all this stuff, you know? Why am I just finding out about this stuff in school? You know, it, it made me feel like stupid, you know, kind of dumb. He was even, he even laughed at me. My, my friend in social studies like, what do you mean you don't know what that is? I didn't. And so I started reading the books at home. And I noticed a fear began. I started to feel fear, and I would close up the books. But the more fear, I don't know, for some reason, I started to connect with these books. It's like the books wanted me to read it. And then the more I read them, the darker they became, and the more interested I became. I became almost like obsessed with knowing what this occult knowing about spells, knowing about horoscopes, knowing about astral projection, all this stuff. And so, you know, this was a huge, huge trap from the enemy. Shortly after that, there was this movie that came out that summer. I'll never forget. It was called The Craft. And it was about four teenage girls. They were like in Catholic school and um, they were dabbling in witchcraft. And so this was like the hot movie then. And so after that, by watching that, I didn't know that our eyes are a gateway, you know, and because I watched that movie, that got me more into horror movies. It got me more into wanting to read more and dive in. Oh, it, it looks so cool. They, they project it to look so cool. And um, I watched it and it just, it, it drew me more curious, more obsessed. Mm. And so then I started asking my friend more questions and he always had the answers. After this, I believe that by opening this door, I opened doors of fear by reading these books, doors of um, like an addiction, a curiosity. And um, shortly after this, you know, we're in lunchroom and my friend brings in this like cardboard and it's a Ouija board, but he made it. And so then he starts showing it to me he's, and all the kids come around and he's showing us how to use it. And, I'm like, this is crazy, you know, this, this guy, you know, he's making this up, you know, and he, he had a pencil that, and the pencil would move. Mm. And, and I was like, this, this is weird, you know, and again, I became more curious, like, what is this? Then he starts telling me, well, this is not the real thing. I made it, but the real board is at Toys R Us. And, you know, then Toys R Us was whoo, super popular. Wow. And we had all the board games, you know, growing up. I had Twister, uh, Hungry Hippo, Operation, Twi uh, all sorts of like the toys that come with the board games. And we had them all, my sister and I. And so I told my parents, I was like, Mom, Dad, I want to get another board game. Oh, okay. So they took me, you know, they, they didn't know. They're just thinking we're adding another board game to the collection. And I'm thinking the same thing, you know. I didn't see maybe anything bad with the board. So I remember getting to Toys R Us. I bought the board. We brought it back home. And and really quick, Andrea, when sure. when you're when you were buying this board, yeah. your parents may not have known what they were taking you for, but yeah. did they get an opportunity to see it? Did they know what they was, considering that they were all Christians and you guys yeah. grew in a Christian environment? No, unfortunately, they did not know, you know. Again, we had so many board games, mm. um, the latest board games, the latest games. They always got us the, the best games, you know, and they said, oh, this is just another game to, to their collection. Wow. And no, unknowingly, you know, this board game looks like the regular board game, and it's in the kids' section, wow. you know. And so you see, they, they didn't see anything. Uh, they didn't make anything of it. And, um, you know, I don't think our, our church was teaching us that, you know. Um, and, you know, they innocently, you know, bought me this game. I took it home, and I didn't play with it right away, but I invited some friends to play, to come over and play with it. We played with it, and I remember that. My sister wanted no part of it. It's like my sister had discernment. My sister was like, yeah, I don't know about that. This, this doesn't look right. doesn't sound right. doesn't feel right. And then I was like, oh, whatever, you know. I just ignored her. And she's my youngest sister. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So, but then we played with it. And then I became really fascinated with it. But I didn't want to play with it alone until 
after playing with it the first time with friends, that night I had a dream that I was playing it by myself. It's like the dream was telling me, play with it. Just play. You can play with it by yourself. You don't need friends to play with it. The next day, I come home from school, and I took the board, and I started playing with it. Ever since I did that, I became obsessed with it. It was like I drew a connection with it, and it was like connected with me. I was connected with it. I couldn't stop thinking about the board, even at school. And it was crazy because I was serving in the church choir, and all I could think about while I was singing was this board. It was like it was calling me. I was becoming possessed by the board game, and I would come home and play with it. And I didn't know that by playing this board game, I was releasing portals. I was opening portals, demonic portals. I was opening doors of spirit of addiction, of fear, of, you know, um, anxiety and panic attacks and so many more things, you know, that led down a, a rabbit hole that led me down a dark path. You know, after this. Now, Andrea, before mm-hmm. you move on in, into even the sure. effects of, of, yeah. of this, um, you know, obviously you looking back now, you can see the open doors. You yeah. can see the the harm that it caused. And, and people yeah. will get to hear that here in a second yes. of, of the harm that came. But when, when, you were, when you were playing as a child... And and obviously, uh, I want to be careful with the information that we give. But yes. but genuinely, can you share with us innocently, or what were you doing with this board? What were the questions that you were asking? What were you doing? Because in your mind, it was you were just playing, right? What did that look like for you personally? Sure. So you know, it started uh, it started telling me to ask it certain questions. I can remember that it was also speaking in a different language. I would write down the 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 words and it was like latin it was like different like weird um languages and then it would start telling me about oh help this dead person he wants to come out of his or his soul he needs help because his soul is trapped or something like that you know weird things it just yeah it became really really um dark it was strange shortly after this i started having sleep paralysis Mm. um i felt a hand covering my mouth and my nose, and I couldn't breathe. I started seeing dark shadows. I started hearing voices. I started having nightmares. Then I saw footprints coming over my bed, my bed being shaken. I mean, I was in fear, and I would tell my mom. It's like my mom believed me, and she would say, Mommy, whenever you feel scared, just say, God, help me, okay? Jesus, help me. And so then I remember that, and I said, Mom, but you don't understand, Mom. I'm really scared. I need your help. Can I sleep with you? Okay, come sleep with me. But I couldn't sleep with her all the time, you know? So then one night, it got really bad, the sleep paralysis, um, and I felt like they were like choking me, and I couldn't breathe. And I said, Jesus, help me. And then all of a sudden, I felt like a relief. Like, it got quiet. And I said, and I put two and two together. I said, oh, my God, this worked. When, if I say Jesus, it, it, it worked, but it just progressively got worse. And then one day when I said enough is enough with this board, I was playing with it. And it said, it said to me, I want you to kill your mother, your father, and your sister, and then come with us. And I said, oh, heck no. I took the board. I broke it. I started cursing at it. My sister came in the room because I was all loud. And she's like, Man, what's wrong with you? I'm going to tell mom, you're possessed. You need to stop playing that game. What happened? I I said, forget this. I took it myself to the trash. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell my sister. I took it to the trash, and I came back. I went to school the next day. I come back home, and that board is sitting on my bed in one piece. Someone or something put it back in the room that point, I thought I was going crazy. I thought I was hallucinating. It was playing tricks on me. I told my mom. She didn't believe me. No one believed me. I became so fearful. I took the board, and then I knew that the board and the books were connected in some way, somehow. They were evil. Mm. And so I took them, and I burned them. I said, I'm burning this stuff. As I was burning them, I felt a relief. I felt a peace, but I didn't know that I was going to be um, attacked that night. My bed was shaken. They choked me. 
And again, I screamed, I screamed again, God help me, save me. Again, they, they released, they, they came off of me. After this, I started having the sleep paralysis, but it became less and less because I knew that every time I said Jesus, it would stop. Shortly after this, I became rebellious. I started skipping school. I started drinking. They, I was introduced to drugs, alcohol. I was starting to, to talk back to my parents a lot. There was a lot of arguments in the house between me and my parents and my sister. I started fighting with my sister a lot. You know, it was just, it was, it, it became chaotic. You know, it wasn't normal. And it, it came to a point where I didn't care about anything. Like, like you became like almost like, like powerful. Like, you know, you felt like you were a gangster, like whatever, you know. And I, I, then I started fighting in, in, in school. I got kicked out of two, two schools because I started fighting. After this, I was introduced to a boy who would change my life. He became my first boyfriend. And my parents found out about the relationship and they said, you have to break that up, up because you are way too young, young lady, to have a boyfriend. And so I didn't, you know, I was rebellious and I kept the relationship and they thought I broke up with him. After this, my parents were planning to already move us somewhere else to kind of start fresh, start new. After all that was happening in the house, we ended up moving. I remember it was my freshman year and it was pretty far away from where, um, you know, we had lived. And my sister and I, we, we hated the place. We hated the new place. It was a very nice area and I get it. My parents wanted the best for us. Um, we started a new school and, you know, I had no friends. We were the minority. It was so different. I remember heading to school. All you could see was cows and roosters and llamas. And it was just completely different. You know, still keeping us away, I still kept my relationship with my boyfriend. And shortly after this, a few months later, one of my girlfriends from my old school that goes to the same school as my boyfriend calls me and tells me that my boyfriend had um, cheated on me. So I confronted him. He denied it. And um, I broke it off with him. You know, I was completely devastated. I was heartbroken. It was my first boyfriend. And so I thought it was love, but it was puppy love. I tried to keep my mind off of the situation. And I went to the mall with my girlfriends and we would go to parties. Um, and one night I ended up going to a, a party and I was drinking. My friends were passing around a blunt. We were smoking. But this weed felt very different. Like everything started moving in slow motion. I started seeing my friends like in triples and I smoked weed before and it never felt like that. And then I started slurring my words. My heart rate was really, really going fast, like boom, 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 and I can hear it. And I started seeing like black shadows. I went to the bathroom to go put some water on my face, you know, thinking maybe it was just me. I come back out and suddenly, I start feeling my heart rate even like slowing down. And I told my friend, I said, girl, please call an ambulance. I feel like I'm about to pass out. And then I could hear my heartbeat go boom, 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 boom. And I collapsed. I fell to the ground. I don't remember what happened after that, but I, got, I ended up in the hospital. Sorry. I woke up the next day and um, I had IVs on my arms and I said, you know, what happened? And then the doctor said, young lady, you are one lucky girl to be alive. When you consumed last night, you overdosed and um, you overdosed on PCP. Hmm. And I didn't know that the weed that we smoked was laced. It was really high levels of it. And how old were you at this time? I was... I was 16 at the time. After this, when I, wake, when I woke up, I said, God, why did you save me? I just wanted to die. My boyfriend had just cheated on me. I felt like everything I was doing was bad. I kept making my parents suffer. My mom would always cry. All that I was putting her through. I was so rebellious. I felt like I had no purpose. I felt like at this point, I had no control of my life. Like something was controlling me. Like I was cursed. Everything that I was doing, it was like, I was sinking in a hole. 
And I just, I couldn't pick myself up. You know, everything that I was doing was just, was bad. So I get home and, you know, I'm, I'm still depressed. I didn't want to go to school. I, I was suicidal at this point. It's like, I didn't want to live. You know, I was embarrassed of what happened. Shortly after this, my ex-boyfriend starts to come around and wait for me at the bus stop. He's like, hey, you know, let's work things out. So I ignored him. And he did this. He was very persistent. He kept doing this over and over until I gave in. I decided to give him another chance. And this was a very, very bad decision I made. After I decided to get back with him, he started getting into drugs, alcohol. He became verbally abusive. Uh, we were getting into a lot of fights. It was very toxic, the relationship. And I almost became very afraid of him. I, I started to become really scared of him because he would call me and tell me that he was watching me and he was telling me what I was wearing and where I was. And, you know, and I was like, this is, this is not normal. This is weird. After this, uh, I was scared to leave him. I found out that I was pregnant. I didn't know what to do. I knew I had to tell my parents. I told my parents and of course, you know, they're not happy, you know, I'm very young. So what happened was that I told my parents and they said that they would help me, that they would support me. And um, I told my boyfriend then, and he became a different person with me as if like he felt like he had so much control over me. And um, he started drinking more. And he started like sinking in a in a hole in a in an addiction, alcohol addiction. One day we're at a birthday party. I'm now seven months pregnant at this birthday party, and I began to talk to one of my girlfriends that he did not like. And he confronts me outside. He's like, "Hey, let's let's go outside. I want to talk to you." I go outside, and out of nowhere, he just hits me, just punches me in the face. He just sees crazy anger outburst out of nowhere. Then he started um, accusing me of things, and I just fell to the ground. All I could do was just hold my, my belly and hope that, pray that he wouldn't hurt the baby. I remember I was just in shock. I came home, and I had a black eye. I had bruises all over my body. And I started covering up the bruising with makeup. And it was really bad because I would get to school and people would ask me, Andrea, what happened to you? Are you okay? I said, oh, I just fell. I had to lie, you know? And I started covering up for him a lot. And it just became worse and worse. I wasn't getting along with my parents at home. And I moved in with my boyfriend. That was a bad mistake. I moved in with him. And um, again, because he was like an alcoholic, I was witnessing him just going downhill. There was one particular evening that I put the, I put the baby to sleep. And I, um, this, I already had had the baby. And I went to sleep myself, and I could hear him come in. And so I would play off like I'm sleeping, because I, I, I was scared of him. And he comes in, and he's messing around with drawers. He's opening up drawers. And then I could watch him, but I'm playing it off, and I'm, I'm trying to sleep you know, playing off like I'm sleeping. And then he grabs a gun. I could see a gun in his hand. And then I started to pray mentally, God, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And then he comes over and he shakes me. And he's like, hey, wake up. And he goes, he puts the gun on my head. He goes, if you ever leave me, I'm going to kill you. I, 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 I was in fear. I didn't know what to do. And because he was so drunk, you know, I didn't say anything. I didn't want to start any arguments because he had a gun. I said, I'm, I'm going to die here tonight. And then I just started praying. I went in the other room with my baby. I just started praying. I said, Lord, help me. Get me out of this relationship or I'm going to die. Either it's going to be me or my daughter or we're both going to die. God, help me. Get me out of this nightmare, Lord. After that, I decided to leave him for good. I called my parents, said, Mom, Dad, please, I need your help. Please come pick me up. They picked me up, and I put a restraining order on him. And I didn't see him for several months. I cut off all contact with him, and he was not allowed to see the baby as well. Several months went by, and um, we heard that he was getting his act together, 
that he went to go seek some help. He was uh, supposedly going to church and he was going to AA meetings and um, he wanted to talk to me. Deep inside, at that time, I didn't know that that was called discernment. Something was telling me, don't, don't talk to him. But I didn't listen to that voice, and I know that that was the Holy Spirit already speaking to me. Even the, the little bit of times that I called on God, and I was only calling Him when I was in need of help, that I regret so much. He listened, and He was preparing me, and He was like, daughter, don't talk to Him. Don't talk to Him anymore. But I didn't listen. And so He he called me and he said, Andrea, I'd like to see the baby again. I want to see if we can maybe co-parent. Why don't we go out to eat and maybe we could discuss something. I thought about it and I said, all right, you know, he hasn't seen the baby in a few months. So, okay. I said, yeah, no problem. He's like, uh, do, you, do you think I can pick you up tonight? And I said, yeah, sure. Okay. We'll go out and we'll, we'll talk. So he picks me up. Baby stayed home with my parents. And on our way, you know, we're, we're on our way to the restaurant, and I know the way, but he takes a different route. And, you know, I didn't say anything at first, you know, but then all of a sudden we're in a, a, a different route where it's just a one-way road, and it's pitch dark. And all you could see is just his headlights. And for some reason, I began to feel fear. And I said, hey, what way are you taking? He's silent. He doesn't say anything. I said, hey, where are you taking me? And all of a sudden, he locks the doors. And he goes in this like deserted like field, like a dark, huge field. It's pitch dark. And then I'm scared. I'm trying to open the door. And then he comes over. He grabs me. He just punches me. I'm laid out cold. I'm trying to regain consciousness because I could hear him. And he's, he, he keeps, he keeps um, punching me. All I can remember was that he comes around out of the car, he grabs my, my body, he takes my, my body out in the middle of a field, and it's muddy, I can remember it was muddy and it was cold. And then he just lays me right there, and I'm weak, I can't, I can't regain my strength, I'm, I'm, I'm really weak. And then he continues to hit me. All of a sudden, I begin to pray, and I'll never forget Psalm 90, 91, that my father taught my sister and I, when you are in trouble, pray this prayer. And I began to pray it. And then I began to say, God, I do not want to die like this. I do not want to die like this, God. I have my daughter waiting for me at home, Lord. Help me, God. Save me, Lord. Help me. I cannot, I cannot um, get up myself, God. Help me. And then all I could see was him getting back into the car. And he's reversing. He's reversing. And I'm trying to regain my strength. And all of a sudden, he's coming towards me. The car is coming towards me. And I said, Jesus, help me. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, three men come. They grab my body. And they pull me out of the way. I should have been dead that night. But God saved me. The Lord saved me. How can three men out of nowhere just be in the middle of a field like that? How? That's God. And I, I'll never forget, I, um, when, they, when they dragged my body, the guys, they let me go. They grabbed him. They started punching him. They, 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 they put him like um, on a lock, like his hands behind his, um, his back until the cops came. The cops came. They arrested him. And we had several um, court dates. And I told the judge, I said, Your Honor, if you let this man out of jail, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me or my daughter. I fear for my life. Please, Your Honor, do something. And, you know, he looked at me with, with fear in his eyes like he believed me. And then um, I found out that he was going to be deported to his country. He got deported. He, was, he served one year in jail, and they deported him back to his country. It was really rough. You know, I lived in um, a lot of fear. I was very paranoid. I remember always coming out of my house, just looking behind my back to see if he was around. For some reason, I didn't believe that he was in jail. I still believed that he was going to come out, and 
out of nowhere and just kill me, or I lived with a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic attacks. I remember calling the ambulance like every week. First time I called them, they said, honey, you're not having a heart attack, you're having a panic attack. No, no, you don't understand. My heart, my heart. If I die, it's going to be from a heart attack. It's not a panic attack. And they did this two, three times, and they already knew, like, it was me. Honey, you are having a panic attack. I was just, I lived in so much fear. I felt like I had no purpose in life. Like, I just, my world, you know, ended. After this, you know, I had to see how I could maintain financially my daughter. And um, I went back to school and I worked a job, but it wasn't enough. I was introduced to a girlfriend. She asked me if I ever needed any extra money, you know, that I could come and work with her. I said, you know, I called her and I said, hey girl, you know, I'm actually interested in making some extra cash. And so then she said, yeah, come with me, girl, let's, let's go. And then we ended up going this is where I got introduced to the strip club industry. Um, I remember the first time I walked in, I was like, yeah, there's no way that I could do this. No, 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 there's no way. Um, and I said, you know, do they, maybe they have a cocktail waitress position. And they were like, no, 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 we're, we're in need of dancers. And, and I was like, oh my God. All right, well, I remember I had a few shots and I don't know where they asked me to start and and I did. I got sucked in very quickly because the money was so good. What I was making in one night, you know, and my other job I was making every two weeks, three, you know. And so I got sucked in into the fast money. Um, I got sucked into the f fast life, you know, of drugs, alcohol. You know, actually many of the girls, I saw many dark things in the strip club business where there was a lot of men that would come that were lonely, that were just wanted love. And some of my customers, they just wanted someone to sit down and talk to. You know, most of my customers were old men, married men, single men who just, yeah, some, some of them were perverted. Others wanted to talk. Others wanted you to drink with them and they would tip you for this. And you know, this became like an addiction because you knew that, oh, I can make X amount of money in one night. And with this, I was able to buy a new car. I was able to pay off my school. I was able to get my daughter all that she needed. I was able to travel, save. Again, it just became very addictive, you know? It's like you had this, like, power. Oh, I can make this money, you know, in one night. But deep still inside, I was still depressed. I still felt alone. I still had anxiety. I still went home with issues, with problems. I had no peace in this industry. I got deeper into drugs. I got into ecstasy. I got into cocaine. And, you know, there were times I wasn't even sleeping, you know, because you were working doubles. So you, you had to be on coke or, or, or you had to drink to stay up, you know. It was a very dark environment, you know. Um, first, it looks so glamorous from the outside, but, but it's not. You know, many of the girls that work there are doing it because they're either just doing it for the money or they're addicted to, to sex or they're addicted to the power that it brings, you know, or they're addicted to drugs, alcohol, you know, and they just feel like they have no purpose in life. Now, I did meet some of the girls that they were full-time students. Some of them were very smart. They would save their money and they would go. But many of the women there that I saw were from years of doing this, of just that they felt like they had no purpose in life, you know? So one day we go out drinking as a group and um, we're drinking and after the night is over, I'm on my way home and I get pulled over by the cops. I get charged with DUI and second degree assault. The officers were pretty, uh, I felt that they were abusive with me, but you know, when you're intoxicated, you don't know what you're doing. So I ended up fighting them, and um, they arrested me. I remember that I was in the back of the car, and I, I was a mess. I was crying. I said, God, why? Why is my life so bad? I had this flashback of just everything that was happening in my life, one thing after another. And then I heard a voice say, when are you going to stop fighting me?
when are you going to surrender your life to me? I started weeping, and I said, now, Lord, help me, because I don't know how to change. And I remember I was just crying. I get to the, the, the jail. They put me in a jail cell by myself, and I remember it was cold. It was a cold concrete floor, and I was just like this, and I was just holding myself, and I was crying. And I said, God, I don't know how to change. I want to change, and I don't know how to. <laughs> I felt like I, I, I have no control of my life, God. How are you going to change me? <laughs> Everything that, am I, that I do in my life is just goes bad. God, help me, because if you're real, I do want to change. I want to get out of this life. If you're real, God, get me out of stripping. And I promise to serve you, God. And then all of a sudden, I'm like this, and I look up, and my, I was sober, like supernaturally. I said, this is so weird. This is so weird. You know, and I look up, and then I begin to just cry even more. And as I'm crying, I can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in the room. I felt a, a tangible presence, like in le electricity from the top of my head all the way to the soles of my feet. And I'm weeping even, even more. Because I knew this was the Holy Spirit because it was such a peace. It was like a holy presence. It was a tangible presence. Like I never experienced this. And I said, I've been waiting for this my whole life. I knew what fear felt like. I knew what anxiety felt like. I knew what panic attacks felt like. I knew what worry felt like, but this was different. It's like God was extending his love, his mercy, his grace over me and said, daughter, I hear you. I've been trying to get your attention, but you haven't listened to me. Now, are you ready? I am real. And I'm touching you right here. And I said, God, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Help me. I want to get out of this lifestyle, Lord. Help me. And so I get out of jail the next day. <laughs> Look at God. And I had just started talking to this boy who is my husband today. His mother-in-law asked him, hey, tell Andrea that there is a, that there is a all-woman's um, retreat coming up next week. And I was like, wow. God heard me so quickly that he wants me to go to this retreat. And I said, tell your mom, yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And I told him about my, my, my experience. And I was actually so excited. Then, right then and there, I made the decision to, to stop. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. I stopped going to the club. I stopped that, that lifestyle. I'll never forget. I packed up my bags, and I was so excited to experience God. I was so excited to feel what I felt in the jail cell again. And I remember it was like two hours away and it was an all girls. I didn't know any of the girls. And we get there and the first night, the worship was so powerful. And all I could do was just lift up my hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving a wretch like me, for saving me, someone who was in darkness, someone who I thought you couldn't save. And look at me in your presence, God. And that night, I experienced his redemption. He saved me. He, he gave me a new name. He gave me hope. He gave me my purpose back. He said, daughter, I do have a plan for you. I do have plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future but just trust me. And I did, and I wept, and I remember I got delivered. I started throwing up. I started coughing. You know, I started weeping. And it was the most amazing experience ever of my life was giving my life to Christ. It was such a transformation, you know. Um, yeah, that mm. is my, my story, my testimony. Andrea, how long have you been faithfully walking with Jesus now? About 13 years. Um, yeah, Eric. In the last uh, 13 years, like you mentioned, you know, all of the darkness that you were in. Talk to us about uh, the last 13 years and how the Lord 
has helped you, has redeemed you, you know, redeemed that time and um, even using you now, mm-hmm. you know, to continue to share the gospel. What, what has these last 13 years been like for you? So, yes, um, when you give your life to, to the Lord, not everything becomes perfect, right? You must read the word, fast, pray to develop a relationship with him. And that's what I started doing. And along the, the, the path with the Lord, I went through trials. I went through tribulations. There were moments that I even questioned him, you know, Father, where are you? There were moments that he was very quiet. And I went through some things and many times that I felt like I, I wanted to give up, but I knew that he was real because I would never forget that experience that I had with him. And so I kept pushing. And along those years, I lost my marriage, you know, even as a Christian, we got divorced and by the Lord's grace, you know, he put us back together and we got remarried. So the Lord still, he makes things easier because when, when his word says, give me your burdens and I will give you rest, you know, you have something and someone to look forward to your daddy to help you that you don't have to do it by yourself, that we have a heavenly father who's helps us uh, mm-hmm. along the way through our, our tribulations and trials. I became a worship leader. I love singing for the Lord, and um, I play the guitar for the Lord as well. And he also gave me a, a voice uh, studio to voice coach people, to voice coach worshipers and worship leaders and worship teams. And I go around in different churches, and I go and I serve the Lord in that, that area. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing today. Yeah. Now, Andrea, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, all of these open doors that came yeah. through uh, the witchcraft that yes. you practiced as a child. When you look, uh, did you have a moment in your life after, you know, now walking with Jesus where yeah. you had that moment of realization of what had happened? What was that like to look back and realize, whoa, you know, as, as far as the witchcraft and, and how did God help close those doors even mm. that once were open? Oh, yes. Um, After I gave my life to Christ, I looked back and I couldn't believe that I went through that. When you draw closer to the Lord, you begin to want to hate what is evil. I started, you know, educating myself of what is it that the Lord dislikes, you know? And he says to expose it, you know, I started educating myself. I started reading about, you know, being delivered. And I myself went through a deliverance process through through my, um, through my encounter with, with the Lord, when I first gave my life to the Lord, I got delivered there. And I also felt like it was a process. So it would just didn't happen right away. I also was, I felt like I was self-delivered along the way. And it took a lot of fasting for me, you know, several months of fasting and just um, renouncing things from my life, you know, and I would buy books of of how to, you know, renounce certain spirits that I had allowed in my life, and it really did help, you know. And by faith, many times I would drink a bottle of water, and I would tell the Lord, Father, this is your blood. I'm going to drink this, and you're going to deliver me from this. And that's that's how I would. Um, that was my my process. Um, but slowly but surely, the Lord helped me along the way with that. Andrea, who is Jesus to you? Hmm. Jesus is my Abba Father. Jesus is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my rock. He is my Redeemer. He is the perfect Son of God. That's who Jesus is to me. Andrea, what is a word of advice that you would give to those people who are currently watching right now and are involved uh, with some of the darkness that you were involved in, specifically with witchcraft, you know, maybe playing with the Ouija board, or maybe they played with the Ouija board b- mm. before and didn't even realize the damage that it was doing. What is a word of encouragement that you would give them as they're watching right now? I would say to please stay away from those things because they can cause you a di- lot of damage as it caused me. You know, it, it is very serious. It, it's very real. It's very dark and it's demonic. And um, just keep it away. Do not mess with these things because once you open these doors, only Jesus can free you. Only Jesus can save you. So it is not worth it. 
it is not worth it. So I would say stay away from that. And what would you say to the parents, right? Because uh, I think from yes. um, before and the time in your testimony, even to now, we've seen an increase yeah. and uh, more stores having yeah. this type of content. Barnes and Noble and different toy stores, Target, all of these different places. So yes. for parents, what would be your advice now from a motherly perspective? Yes, definitely. Um, just be aware what you are buying your kids. You know, check in on them. Check and go in their room, see what they're doing. Listen, they don't pay the phone bill. Check their phone, see what's going on with them. You know, um, it's not about being overprotective. It's just... Listen, you know, we live in a, in a dark world and we need to be on top of our kids yeah. um, and talk to them a lot. Don't hide things from your kids. Just talk to them. Tell them what's good, what's bad, you know, and uh, always encourage them um, through the word. And um, yeah, I, I, that, that, that's my advice. Just, yeah. yeah. And lastly, Andrea, what would you say? Uh, a word, word of encouragement can you give to that person who is right now going through uh, abuse? Mm. You know, you found yourself in a place where um, you experienced this in your life yes. personally. So for that person who's watching and is currently experiencing that in their life, what is a word of encouragement that you can offer to them? Sure. You're not alone. The Lord knows what you're going through. The Lord knows your pain and he wants you to seek help. Don't keep it in. Don't cover up for him or her. Ask the Lord to free you from that relationship. And um, the Lord is going to heal you through those wounds. It didn't happen overnight for me, but it was a process of even forgiving the person who abused me. Make sure that you do tell somebody. Tell somebody before, God forbid, something bad were to happen. So that is my, my words for, for the people. I also wanted to share that after the abuse, after he was deported, I wanted to share with everyone what happened after that. After his deportation, many years down, he contacted me through Facebook, and um, he asked me to forgive him. He told me that he gave his life to the Lord. He got married, and he has two kids. And, you know, when I heard that, I became so happy for him. Wow. And, you know, right then and there, you want to say, no, I don't want to forgive, but you have to forgive. And I had to forgive in order to heal, to close that chapter in my life. I praise God that today I've forgiven him, and I'm so happy that he's changed his life. He also serves the Lord. So I thought I'd share that with yeah. you. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Andrea, do you have any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? Yes. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait to give your life to Christ. Giving your life to Christ is the best decision you could ever make. And I wish that I hadn't gone through everything that I'd gone through. But, you know, we all share a story. And the Lord can use you as well of what you're going through. You're not alone. The Lord loves you. He has a perfect will for your life, a perfect plan for your life, but surrender it to Him. Surrender it all. Humble yourself and ask the Lord, Father, help me in this situation. Father, reveal yourself to me, and He will reveal Himself to you. If He can do it for me, He can do it for you. If, if I was, like I felt like I was a no one, let me tell you something. We are, we are daughters and sons of the most high god and he has a amazing plan for your life so call on him jesus is the dopest decision you could ever make Amen. in jesus name andrea can you pray for those who are watching right now and are saying you know what yes. i want to know jesus yeah. you know i want to encounter him for for myself i i want him to reveal him to uh, himself to me can you just pray for them yes. as they're listening right now Yes. Father God, we come before you today, my Lord, and I thank you for all those who are watching, Father. And I ask, God, that you would remove the veil off the eyes of your children, God, and soften their hearts, Heavenly Father. Father, I pray, Lord, that they would turn to you 
that all of a sudden they would just grow a hunger and a thirst, Father, to know you, Father God. Make yourself real to them, Father, and take this testimony, my Lord, Father, to the ends of the earth, to those who are hurting, God, those who are lost, Father, those who have lost all hope, Heavenly Father, those who are battling addiction, Father, those who are going through witchcraft, Father God, those, Father God, who are just who are just in need of you, my Lord, Father, I ask God that they would humble themselves, Father, and turn to you, God, Father. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen and amen. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the U.S. right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.